Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before we get into that, I have to thank you for coming to my channel and blowing it up. It's unbelievable what's happening. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. I really, really do. It's amazing to me that my channel has grown as much as it has. And all I can do is thank you because you're the ones who are coming back and telling me wonderful things. So thank you very much. The first item that I have for the news today <clears throat> is something that's inspirational. And I thought you might enjoy it. And actually I had planned on this being the only thing I did today. But unfortunately world news has gotten in the way. So we're going to watch this first and then I'll talk about the other things. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Let me get the right thing up here. What this is, is a, uh, it's Are a you brief speech. Are you looking for a new fence or gate for your home or property? Man Type named in Matt your address Schlereth, and drop the red pins. Who is an the NFL uh, retiree, if you will, or pro who's retired. And he's speaking to the football players at uh, the University of Colorado. But what he has to say, I thought was really inspiring, and so I wanted to share it with you. You really are, all right? Because for, for one, this guy's a fan of this team. Okay, that guy that's talking right now is uh, Steve Mariucci, who used to be an NFL coach. But Matt Schlereth will be coming up in just a second. And I love where you're doing it. I love how you do it. So just show the world, okay? Yeah. I love it. Appreciate you, Mooch. Appreciate you, man. I love you. I, I do. I love you. We came in together. 1989. He was like the fourth pick. I was like the 263rd. They don't even have that anymore. That didn't even exist. My name is Mark Schlereth. Played, uh... Here in Denver, played 12 years in the National Football League, went to the University of Idaho. We call that the Harvard of the Northwest, only the smart kids get in there. But let me just tell you guys a couple of things uh, from my perspective. I love team. I love being part of a team. I love the connection of a team. I love the sacrifice of a team. You know, there's always companies that put out mission statements, right? And I always used to have a personal mission statement for myself, but it comes from Philippians. Paul writing to the church at Philippi from prison. Now, if I'm writing from you, or if I'm writing to you from prison, I'm going, come get me out, right? Come help me out. But he's writing a letter of encouragement to the church. And he says in chapter 2, verse 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, treat others as one is more important than yourself. Whoa. That is my personal mission statement. When I meet people, I want to love on them. I want to connect with them. I want to be a part of that because success leaves fingerprints. And every one of you has an opportunity to leave a fingerprint on this community, on this team, on these coaches, and everybody in Boulder and beyond. Man, I got to watch you guys last year. I was sitting in a meeting room every Saturday watching what was going on here. And I'm connected, man. I feel awesome about what you guys are doing and the sacrifices that you are making. Let me tell you something about myself. I was retired from college football as a junior because of my injury history. Anybody who knows me knows that I had 29 surgeries over the course of my career. I had 20 knee surgeries, 15 on my left knee alone. Let me tell you how I got in the National Football League. I came back from an injury and begged the university to let me play my senior year. Switch from the defensive side of the ball to the offensive side of the ball. I didn't have an agent. I didn't get invited to the combine. I didn't have anything. But I made it through my senior year as an offensive lineman. And I had a defensive lineman that was a buddy of mine, my partner, Marvin Washington. Marvin and I were tight. Marvin came, he's a basketball player that came from UTEP to the University of Idaho because they canceled the basketball program. And he's six foot six, he's 270, chiseled from granite, and we knew on campus 
dude, you're better than anybody we got. Would you come play football for us? And it'd be 14 sacks his senior year and being invited to combine and having all these opportunities. I had nothing. My year was done and I had this dream since I was 12 years old to play in the National Football League. One night my phone rings, it's Marvin Washington. He said, hey, the Bengals are gonna work me out tomorrow morning in the facility, why don't you come crash my workout? So I showed up to Marvin's workout, introduced myself to scouts, and begged for an opportunity just to run. And I could run and I could jump and I could bench and I could do all those things. As a matter of fact, I did everything. Vertical jump was better than Marvin's. My 40 time was better than Marvin's. My bench press time was better than Marvin's, or was more than Marvin's. My eye show test was better than Marvin's. I killed him in his own workout. And yet, you know what? He loved me so much and he knew about what I wanted and he knew about my dreams and aspirations that he invited me to about seven more of his workouts. Yes, yes. And seven more times I whipped his butt in every category. He got drafted in the sixth round by the Jets. That probably cost him three or four rounds. But he kept calling and I kept showing up and I got myself to the point where teams actually looked at me and started looking at my film. And then they started calling me and I got drafted in the 10th round to the University of Idaho, or from the University of Idaho to, to the Washington Redskins. Let me tell you something. I would not have played a down in the NFL if it wasn't for my teammate who was willing to sacrifice for me. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't have played a, I wouldn't have played a second in the National Football League if Marvin doesn't call me, if he doesn't care enough about me, even above himself. I mean, one workout when I, when I put it to him, that would be enough, right? I couldn't invite me to my workouts, or to his workouts. But he kept inviting me, kept inviting me, kept inviting me. So I go on to play for 12 years. After about my eighth year or ninth year, we win the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 32 with the Denver Broncos, beat the Green Bay Packers 31-24. I'm sitting in the training room where I spent most of my time rehabbing whatever surgery I just had, and Mike Shanahan, our head coach, comes down. And Mike says, hey man, listen, You've been in this league a long time. You know all the different defensive linemen. He goes, I need a rotational guy, a backup guy that can play DN, that can play D-tackle, somebody that can fit, but most importantly, somebody who has the character and integrity to play for the Denver Broncos. And he hands me a list. And on that list, there's a name. And that name is Marvin Washington. I said, sign him. I don't play down in the National Football League if it's not for Marvin Washington, and he doesn't get to win a Super Bowl because we won one together. I know teammates, we won one together. He doesn't win a Super Bowl, it's not for me. So being part of a team is one of the best things that I've ever been involved in. And it's what I've carried with me from, from football to television, to my family, to beyond. It is one of the greatest things and one of the greatest joys. And you guys have the opportunity to change, literally change a community, change the world, and change each other's lives. So invest, I still, to this day, have a reunion every year with all my Idaho teammates. About 15 of us show up every year, we've been doing it for 30 years, because we mean that much to one another. So what a pleasure it is to be here. I'm uh, an open book, if you need to know anything, I'd love to help you out. Offensive lineman, I'm all over. Sat, I love you too. Love you back, I, I hated playing against you, but I love you. <laughs> That's it, man. Thank you, guys. Wasn't that fantastic? What a great story. It's just so inspiring to think about how decisions that you make and things that you do in your life can impact other people in ways that you never realized. <clears throat> As he told in the story, Marvin Washington would not have a Super Bowl ring if it were not for him, but he would not have a career in the NFL if it were not for Marvin. So Marvin's sacrifice in possibly lowering his draft status by allowing Mark to come and, tr and work out with him ended up getting him a Super Bowl ring. You never know when you when you touch somebody's heart 
what it will do. So never be afraid to do the right thing. All right, now we get to the rotten world stuff. Um, this is an article by Matt Friedman on uh, a free press, on the free press. The title of it is The Real World War in the Middle East Comes Into Focus. As I'm sure you're probably already aware, um, the uh, Iranians have attacked Israel. And so I'm going to read just a little bit of this. But like a flash going off in a dark room, the attack from Iran has finally given the world something valuable, a glimpse of the real war in the Middle East. For the past six months, since the Hamas massacres of October 7th, the ideological forces arrayed against Israel have done their best to make this seem like a war in which there are two sides and that these sides are Israeli soldiers and Palestinian civilians. This information campaign is as critical to Israel's enemies as the physical war because it erodes the Western support that Israel needs to, to win and survive. Its successful execution has turned a jihadi war against the Jewish minority enclave in the Middle East into a story about Jewish oppression and even genocide of Palestinians, a story that has become the focus of the increasingly deranged discourse in the liberal West. That is so true. But the reason why I want to bring this up, because I'm, I'm sure you're already aware of this. I don't have to tell you about this. But the reason I want to bring it up is because this stinks of Vietnam. And here's why. The title of this one is American Anti-War Activists Cheer for Iran's War. Now, I'm going to read you one paragraph. And then I'm going to talk about it. About 300 anti-war activists crowded into the basement of the Teamsters Union's headquarters on Saturday to hear organizers from all over the country describe their plans to disrupt the Democratic National Convention this August. Joe Biden's backing of Israel since Hamas's October 7 attack has turned these left-wing radicals against their own party. Same exact thing happened in 1968 during the Vietnam War. The radical activists came and disrupted the Democratic Convention. Why? Because they know they can affect the Democrats, but they don't think they can affect the Republicans so much. Now, here is a statement from one person who attended. Iran is part of the resistance, said the woman who flew in that morning from New Orleans, where she's been part of an effort to disrupt Israeli-bound shipments in her hometown. Yemen and Iran and Hezbollah, who are also a militant group in Lebanon, and the Syrian government are all parts of the arc of resistance. A smile creeps across her face as she tells me this. They're part of the arc of resistance between the en and the enemy because... The enemies are Israel and the United States. Now, I'm going to change the headline because this headline is a lie. It says American anti-war activists cheer for Iran's war. What it should say is anti-American pro-Iranian activists cheer for Iran to win the war against Israel. Because that's the truth. Now, I know this woman is not, you know, probably thinking that way when she writes the headline, but that's the truth. These people are exactly like the quote, quote, anti war people that protested in the Vietnam War. They were not trying to stop the war, they were vote. they were cheering the, uh, communists in, in North Vietnam on. They were actually carrying North Vietnamese flags in the streets of America and cheering for them to win the war. They were not anti-war. They were pro-communist victory. And these people are pro 
jihadist victory. That's what they are. Let's keep it straight. These are not anti-war activists. Now, when I say that, I want you to understand not everyone who gets involved in an anti-war movement is pro the opposition, but the leadership always is because they're the same people over and over and over again. They, they use the freedoms that we have in America to advocate for the other side to win the war against the U.S. and against Israel. They did it in the 1960s. They're doing it again now. They'll do it every single time a war comes. They will, they will cheer for the bad side, not the good side. They will cheer for whoever is against the U.S. and they will cheer against the U.S. and they want the U.S. to be destroyed. That's the truth. Now again, I repeat, not everyone who attends an anti-war movement is that way. Some people are genuine pacifists. They're just opposed to war in all forms. And that's fine. You can be that. But these people are, that are leading these things and the, the big heavy duty activists that are involved in these things are not anti-war. They're pro-communism. They're pro-jihad. They're anti-U.S. And they're anti-Europe too. They want the West to fail and they want the evil forces to overtake the world. That's what they want. So always keep that in mind when, <clears throat> when, you're, <clears throat> when you're reading newspaper articles or watching TV shows, uh, news shows where they talk about the anti-war activists. They're not talking about anti-war activists. They're talking about pro-evil activists. That's what they're really talking about. And it just... When I read this article, it just blew my mind because it was, it just brought back 1960s immediately. Same exact thing. They actually marched through the streets of New York in a demonstration carrying communist North Vietnam flags and cheering for a communist North Vietnam to win the war that the U.S. was fighting. I don't have to tell you what I'd like to do with these people, but of course they have the right to do what they want in our country because we're never going to do anything about it. We're never going to throw out people who are against the United States. We just tolerate them. And I suppose that's what we should do, but man, they just irritate me to no end. So that's my news for today. I thank you for coming to my channel. I thank you for watching my videos and I thank you most of all for being blessed by God that he keeps you abundant in your life, that he keeps you healthy and gives you long life and that he keeps you safe from harm. And I pray that he'll do that for every person that you love as well. And I also pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving you will make your requests known to God, and the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.